thanks everybody for coming this afternoon. Um, this is the brown bag I'm giving about the Atlantic mackerel. Um, I'll be talking about sort of some new migration and population structure information that we discovered and then how this could impact the management. To begin with, the Atlantic mackerel span the entire North Atlantic um, with populations in the Northeast centered around Europe um, and then populations or a population in the Northwest, um, which sort of spans between the U.S. and Canada. I'll be primarily talking about these uh, Northwest Atlantic species today. And so this population is traditionally uh, broken down into two separate contingents, a northern contingent around Canada and a southern around the United States. These are both migratory, swimming north in the spring and returning south in the winter. These contingents are also managed separately between the two countries but they do have some level of overlap uh, in their migration, and it's this overlap that keeps them from fully separating a different population <laughs> or species. And Atlantic mackerel, um, there's been kind of a, a change in their population over time. We had 400,000 metric tons of catch in the U.S. Uh, in the 1970s. We're down to just 5,000 today, and this decline points to a lack of understanding in sort of the population dynamics that are controlling the species. Some plausible, um, plausible causes for this decline include true collapse in the population due to these really high levels of fishing in the 1970s, changes in the fishery affecting our ability to target and find capture the fish, um, or finally, as we're most interested in here, potential for a spatial shift in the population itself which would affect um, what fishermen and surveys are actually seeing. The original concept of the two contingents that I just introduced um, is based on over 60-year-old work, and this was done by Oscar Steady, as shown here, and more recent attempts to look at the spatial structure using genetics and different chemical methods have shown not nearly the same level of separation that he found uh, previously. Additionally, Atlantic mackerel are a migratory fish with a history of fairly extensive uh, spatial shifts. So here we have um, data from Overholt et al. in 2011, which is the center of mackerel catch from the spring trawl survey uh, in the northeast United States. In the left panel, each of the individual dots shows that yearly value for that center of catch. And we can see there's a lot of variability for the species and its location potentially some indication of a shift. When we look to the right panel, those individual years have been averaged together to give us a single value for each decade. And this more clearly shows the northward shift through time um, up the coast, which has been attributed to potentially changing temperatures. We're thinking about a spatial shift in terms of in terms of migratory fish. It's important to understand how um, their spatial structure is currently defined. And we know that it's separated into two contingents, and here we have sort of the natal habitats that define those contingents. So this is the area of the first year of life for both the northern and southern groups of those fish. In this work, we're going to look and see if um, these groups truly are separated, and we plan, or we did do that using otolith chemistry techniques to assess the, the origin of an individual fish and compare that to where it was captured uh, later in its life. For those of you unfamiliar with an otolith, uh, it's a calcium carbonate structure inside the, inside the head of fish, um, and it grows incrementally, giving us a record of age, which is really useful uh, for a lot of fishery scientists. But the material that's deposited is also metabolically inert, so it maintains a record of the chemistry um, that that fish was exposed to. And we can use that uh, chemical record to give us an environmental history for the fish. One aspect of, of otolith chemistry that has been really useful in the North Atlantic to look at fish migration uh, is stable isotopes. Here we have oxygen stable isotopes and the distribution across the North Atlantic with uh, lower latitudes corresponding to relatively high levels of these heavy oxygen isotopes, um, which is 
shown through more red colors and um, positive delta oxygen 18 values. In more northern latitudes, we have uh, blues and greens, more cool colors, and these correspond to negative delta oxygen 18 values and scarce levels of these heavy oxygen. This pattern is uh, mostly controlled by evaporation and precipitation rates. We can also see the influence that currents like the uh, Gulf Stream can have through the whole basin scale. So that was the oxygen isotopes uh, in the seawater, and this doesn't directly translate to otolith oxygen isotopes. We actually have a negative relationship with temperature. So at cooler temperatures, we see a greater positive departure from that seawater value uh, when it's deposited into the otolith. And this basically happens because um, those heavy isotopes should fall into place in the carbonate structure of the uh, otolith a little easier. Thinking about isotopes, it's also important to go over delta notation. This is the major um, sort of way that we talk about stable isotopes, and it's fundamentally the ratio of heavy to light isotopes in our standard, or in our sample, divided by the ratio of heavy to light isotopes in the globally accepted standard. And then that number <coughs> scale just to be a little bit easier to work with. We can do this in terms of the heavy oxygen-18 isotopes versus oxygen-16, or um, carbon isotopes, which are their major, com major constituents of uh, calcium carbonate. When we look at these predicted uh, oxygen isotope values in the otolith, we see a pattern that's still uh, mostly controlled by latitude, but the color scale here is actually split. So these um, lower latitudes in the south, in the more southern North Atlantic, uh, are actually negative delta oxygen 18 values, uh, and northern areas have uh, more positive delta oxygen 18. And this shows that that temperature relationship really outweighs the influence of the seawater oxygen isotope values. Looking in the Northwest Atlantic, where the majority of this talk is focused, you can see some evidence that U.S. waters or fish from U.S. waters should have lower uh, delta oxygen team values in their otoliths compared to Canada and Iceland uh, or. Otoliths from the Northeast Atlantic, including Iceland and Norway, should have much higher uh, delta oxygen 18 values. And we use these fish as an outgroup because they show up from a different population and they should have this drastically different uh, oxygen isotope signature. So to, to get back into uh, thinking about our project, the major question here is to understand the population structure of this Atlantic mackerel species. We're going to do this in two steps. First, we're going to look at the different natal habitats and um, look for regional isotopic, isotopic differences between these habitats, which would set up um, isolation between these groups and give us potential for there to be um, these different contingents that can exist later. We'll then look um, at older fish to assess site fidelity and uh, the presence or absence of repeated migration, which should show uh, not only that there are separate natal habitats, but also that these habitats confer with them for the different migratory pattern, um, and therefore that should confirm that there are contingents that are remaining fairly separated. We're looking at age two fish, just one year older, sort of the, uh, the younger fish that we'll be looking at natal origin in. And we'll also be looking at older adults um, classification methods to try to compare them to compare their natal origin to where they were captured. The otoliths that we obtained here are all archived, um, majority coming from the Northeast Fisheries Science Center's trawl survey. For part one, we're looking at these age one fish. Uh, in the second portion, we'll be looking at older fish, age two through age four. Majority of our samples come from 1999 through 2001 focusing on the U.S., to a slightly lesser extent Canada, which represents our northern contingent. And then I mentioned these outgroup samples we have from the Northeast Atlantic, uh, which represent Iceland and Norwegian samples. To extract uh, otolith material and actually uh, measure the isotopic composition, we're using precision milling techniques to sort of 
grind out this central region, uh, shown here in red. And you can see anodalus has been ground um, over here to the right. As we get into the first portion, looking for those uh, differences in sort of natal habitats, the first thing they should be ordered uh, with the Northeast Atlantic having the highest delta oxygen 18 values, Canada and uh, northern contingent fish being sort of in the middle, and U.S. Uh, origin fish having the lowest reported delta oxygen 18 values. I briefly mentioned uh, delta carbon 13 or carbon isotopes previously. Uh, this is a little bit less useful. For, uh, for our, our study here, it's in the larger scale of my thesis, I used a little bit more, but here, um, just to say, it's not very useful because uh, it not only shows the sort of environmental influence that oxygen is telling us, but also some information about diet and metabolism and metabolism in the fish, so it's a little more confounded. To get into our data, here we have evidence for um, regional separation between those to, or between those uh, natal habitats. We have a scatter plot with oxygen isotopes on the x-axis, carbon isotopes on the y-axis, with each individual point showing the isotopic value of a given otolith. These clusters um, represent the different regions, and the dashed ellipse shows the 60% confidence interval, the solid ellipse shows the 90% confidence interval. What we're looking for in these plots is the level of separation between these clouds of points. And we can see distinct separation between the Northeast Atlantic and the Northwest Atlantic, um, showing that different populations are uh, different, or showing that different populations have different isotopic composition, especially in terms of oxygen isotopes. Within the population, we see really high levels of overlap uh, in the Northeast Atlantic. And in the Northwest Atlantic, there's some um, degree of overlap between the US and Canada. Despite that, significant isotopic differences were found in terms of both carbon and, and oxygen uh, for the U.S. and Canada. We also see much higher variation uh, for these U.S. and Canadian samples. We have a pretty good spread across years with this data, so we're able to look at some of that variation a little deeper. Here, the values are broken down um, into year-specific terms for both the U.S. and Canadian samples, with the bold line of these box plots showing the median, the extent of the boxes um, represents the 25th and 75th percentiles, and the extent of the whiskers, or the dashed line, shows um, the data up to 1.5 times the interquartile range. Looking at this, we can see uh, some evidence of a rising pattern for both the U.S. and U.S. and Canada through time. Again, in the larger scale of my thesis, we investigated this rising pattern, but for our purposes here, it's just important to note that there is variation across years. We don't have stability, especially in terms of oxygen isotopes, between a given set of years. Looking at carbon isotope data, we saw slight significant differences between the regions, but when we look at year specific, when we break that out into individual years, um, see that there's no significant differences. So this shows that carbon isn't variable on the same time scale that our oxygen isotopes are. Let's wrap up part one and think about evidence we have here for distinct natal habitats. Um, we did see those isotopic differences between the regions, and they ordered sort of in the way that we expected coming in. We saw slight variation. The delta oxygen, delta carbon 13 values. And we also saw this annual variation for oxygen isotopes, especially with the rising pattern in the US and Canada. And this will be really important later, or actually in the next portion, because we need to, this shows us that we need to do any, um, any year class map, or any, this shows us that any, um, age specific work that we're doing needs to be specific to that given year class because isotope signals change over time. Let's look to part two. Since we've confirmed that there are different natal habitats, now we need to confirm, or now we need to show if those habitats confer some, some migratory difference. 
we'd expect H2 fish to show a level of site stability uh, back to their natal habitat, and this would manifest as the central region of that H2 otolith having the exact same uh, delta oxygen 18 value as an H1 fish if those two fish were from the same region and uh, originate from the same gear class. Additionally, we'll be looking at older results, um, age three to age four, uh, matching the year classes that we have uh, shown here on the slide. And these were all captured in the United States, so they would reasonably be expected to originate uh, from the U.S., but we'll be treating them as unknown just to test the, uh, test the value of these methods with a little bit more extension. Here we have box plots again showing the age one, age one fish versus age two fish from the U.S. and Canada. We use Nessa de Nova. So an age one fish here uh, from the 1998 year class would have been born or would have been captured in 1999, um, and an age two fish relevant to this year class would have come from the year 2000. We use the Nesta de Nova to first confirm the uh, region-specific or country-specific uh, differences between these groups, and then look within the different countries to compare H2 to H1 fish. We saw significantly higher um, delta oxygen 18 values for H2 fish than H1, and this is true for both the U.S. and Canada. In the 1999-year class, which would be an H1 fish captured in the year 2000 and an H2 fish from 2001. We again saw country or region specific differences, but here only saw H2 fish to be significantly higher in the U.S. sample. Bring in those unknown samples that I mentioned before. They were all captured in the United States, so we expected them to more closely align with uh, U.S captured H1 and H2 fish, but as we can see for the 1998 year class, they're actually really close, uh, closely matched to the Canadian fish. And this is also true for the 1999 year class. To get into what proportion of these unknown samples actually originated from um, either of these natal habitats, we're using this classification, uh, we're using classification methods. The basic idea here is to take the baseline data that we have um, and create some kind of function that relates that to a given region of origin. And then we're going to use those functions to classify our unknown samples and give their likely region of origin. First example we're using is random forest. If you have any questions about these uh, methods, please let me know. But just going to be really brief here. Basically, this is a resampling technique, kind of like bootstrapping that's based on simple classification trees like we have here. We also use logistic regression, which fits this, this S-curve between um, the U.S. origin, the Canadian origin, and the different isotope values on the x-axis. Finally, we have quadratic discrimination analysis, which is kind of a multi-dimensional approach, really similar to uh, principal component analysis, where we redraw an axis through the data. So here we have the, or the classification results, and there's a lot of information on this slide, so I'll kind of walk you through it. Each one of these individual bar plots shows the percentage of that unknown sample, or of the unknown sort of population that's expected to originate from either the U.S. in red or Canada in blue. If we look across rows, we're looking within an individual year class. Um, and comparing the three different uh, classification methods that I just outlined. Columns, we're comparing how those methods are looking between the year classes. So is there any year-to-year -year variation in sort of the results that we see? <laughs> On the whole, we can see the three methods uh, across rows agree fairly well, especially within a given year class. Um, and the 2000s, we look up and down the columns, the 2000 year class seems to have significantly higher U.S. classification than the other year classes. But on the whole, these U.S. captured adults appear to be originating from the Canadian contingent 
at least by their stabilizing code values. As we wrap up that section and move towards the conclusion, we saw these age specific differences with the H2 fish having significantly higher oxygenizative values than H1. This was especially prevalent in the United States. Um, and this could be evidence of intrusion of the northern contingent fish into the southern region um, beginning at that age. Looking at older adults, we saw very high levels of mixing with Canadian fish dominating the sample that we had in uh, two out of three years, but we also saw evidence of year-to-year -year variation in that level of mixing because the year 2000 year class was slightly more evenly dispersed between the two regions. So that was a lot of panels and graphs that are basically getting at migration, but with this spatial topic it's probably good to break it down in terms of a map. So. Thinking about our age one fish, we saw evidence of distinct natal habitats here. So they're kind of self-recruiting and maintaining uh, their natal origin in terms of isotope data. Looking at age two fish, there was limited evidence of this repeat migration and returning to your natal origin, but also some evidence that uh, Canadian fish were coming down into the United States beginning at that, or beginning at that age. When we look to age three fish and older, the story gets a little bit more complex. Um, and so walking through it, we saw very strong evidence of these Canadian fish being present in the southern contingent at these older ages. We also saw some evidence of US, US fish remaining in this area, but limited evidence. And that the absence of the, the whole scale absence the absence of uh, these U.S. fish in that southern contingent draws the question of have they uh, are they simply less numerically abundant in the region and the northern northern contingent fish are dominating, or have they adopted some other migratory pathway um, and therefore they're just not being sampled by the survey. Additionally, nothing about the information we have here says what uh, Canadian or northern contingent adults actually look like. So there's sort of a question mark on this arrow. Uh, are they self-recruiting back to their natal habitat? So how does what does this imply for management of the species? If you'll remember, I said that the two contingents are managed separately uh, as it currently stands. We saw a lot of evidence of really high levels of mixing between the groups and uh, a lot of uncertainty about where these adults actually originate. So this implies that we should probably manage the two contingents as a combined stock uh, and cooperation should be strengthened between the U.S. and Canada for the management of Atlantic mackerel. Additionally, most of this data comes from a single uh, Northeast Fisheries Science Center's trawl survey and we saw a mixed, mixed idea of what that survey is really telling us. Juvenile abundance appears to be related to Southern contingent, pops of the southern contingent, and uh, U.S. born fish, while adult abundance seems to be dominated by northern originating fish from the Canadian contingent. And this really points, this really shows that there might be um, an inability within this survey to kind of track year classes and um, understand those age specific patterns through time. And with that, I'd like to thank all the people who helped and ask you guys for any questions. Well, what do you think is driving the southward migration of the Canadian? Because you had mentioned earlier temperature, and I would kind of expect for the opposite to happen. Yeah, so we definitely expected that too. And part of it, I think, gets into these questions we had of the survey at the end, um, these shifting temperatures, it's not, it's not only going to change sort of the scale of migration and how far north they're going to go, but it can also change the timing. Uh, and so if it's warmed recently, uh, and this survey is fairly static in time as well as space. So it could just be constantly looking at the same window, space, and time um, while the fish has just shifted some way um, 
in time is that potentially we're seeing Canadian fish that are just starting their migration earlier or starting it later than they used to, and so they're falling within the survey window now. Yeah, so the comment was on sort of Gulf Stream waters can interact with sort of the Canadian region, um, and therefore that could be driving some of the isotopic differences that we've observed, but also could be driving some of the temperature based behavior differences that the macro were showing. So the question was about sort of the timing of sample collection um, and how many years we use, and also. Um, the age of the mackerel and the potential to use this technique into an older age group. Um, so again, these are all from the spring trout survey, which is uh, it's a very limited time window, or it's a few months, but it's a limited time window, but it's the major data source that's used for the assessment as well. So part of this work was to also understand how good that data source could be um, to understand the dynamics of the population. And so this work kind of draws into question some of the things that that survey could be telling us. Um, and Atlantic mackerel lived to about 14 years, so we could potentially go out that far, but um, you'd have to use slightly different techniques to get sort of to the to isolate the central region of the otolith. But another good thing about using this survey is that there's like 40 years of these otoliths just sitting in a warehouse, so you could if you found the time and money, you could do these same methods and understand sort of the pretty long longitudinal time series of um, what these patterns have been for Atlantic mackerel over a very long time. Yeah, thank you.